Our guest for today's episode is Abhiraj Singh. He is currently working as a senior product designer at Sender Berlin. He has previously worked at Omeo and Housing India. He is also the co-founder of the Listen app. I am Mayank Khandelwal and you are listening to whiteboard.fm. How's it been, man? How long have you been since? How long have you been designing in Berlin? So uh, I have been in Berlin since February two thousand eighteen. Right, and uh, it's been a little over two and a half years. It's been good. Uh, it's it's um, it's it's a different uh, culture. It's a different work, working style that people have. I think every country, uh, every culture has a different style of working, and I'm learning a bunch of things uh, here. um it's it's interesting to see how people uh i i think i think in india we do work longer hours at times uh, <laughs> uh we're notorious for that uh and i one of the first things i noticed was that there is a difference in the number of hours uh people put in so i like it i like it the thing is that uh i i feel that we can really do more focused work while we're at the office so uh i i think like one small change is uh, there's more chit chat in the indian offices that i used to work at versus the ones here there's less chit chat because people just come they get their work done and they go home and they go home to spend time with their hobbies or whatever they like to do and um, versus in india i used to see that people would um really spend a lot more time in the office Yeah. not work this is just a thing like that hmm. so nice got it interesting that's really interesting because so because i don't have i haven't been a part of that kind of mindset at all really and listening about that knowing that it exists it's very different also before designing in designing in berlin you were designing at in india right so you know better of in terms of the difference in the culture and the difference in the working and mindset that is there so yeah. can you tell us more about your journey uh, in in the basis of how you started as a developer you started as an ios developer then you moved to the role of a co-founder at listen and yeah. then you are currently working as a senior designer so how is that how did that work out so uh yeah man that's that's interesting so uh i um so so basically i started off as a person who was just interested in computers okay so and i was like 11 years old i was uh, uh i was uh, i started programming and i wrote like this first program and this is 2001 when kon banega karodpati this show uh who wants to be a millionaire yeah. uh the, the version of that uh came on tv and i just wrote a command line program in basic for that now the thing to pay attention to here is my whole life uh the whole you know these my whole teenage years because of that particular incident my whole teenage years i thought that i am a developer and i need to be a programmer but the thing that i did not realize was that when i was writing that program that kvc program the most fun thing for me was writing the copy and how can i emulate amitabh bachchan speaking through this command through this command line to this person so i realized that i was effectively designing an experience through the means of code right. so that that's where designing comes in actually it's not about the tools it's about the outcome hmm. so for me i thought the only tools i had at that point were coding because design was graphic design and i wanted to design digital products so i did not know if something like that existed so fast forward to uh college i uh i, I thought i still was in this confused state where i thought i should be a developer and in college i found out that i can design ui using photoshop and that's when i picked up photoshop and i just taught myself the basics of ui design right and 
but it still didn't work out because i did know how to do this but i just was not formally trained i just was not good enough that someone would hire me as a designer my skills as a developer were just much stronger i had a fucking degree um i yeah. was thinking to prove for my design skills yeah so i just entered the industry as a developer as a front end developer so that after entering the industry i was in a small app development agency so that's one thing i really wanted to do uh, everyone in my engineering college were going for different companies uh, i was not sure if i wanted to join a big company or something i just wanted to do cool stuff so i found this guy these people at back then like app development was not this is like 8 9 years ago and app development was just picking up yeah so and apps is where it's at i'm going to enter the app space so i got like a very early look into ios development that was early in my career that's how i got eventually from that little agency i got my job at wink music i was one of the first ios developers for wink music uh, it became pretty big uh so and then while i was at wink music that's where the real transition into design started happening so i wanted to transition from a developer role into a design role because i could see a lot of fundamentals that people were lacking so we had the company they had hired hired a few designers who were traditional graphic designers they were they won't they weren't able to understand how ui traditionally works and i could see that and i could see product managers also not being able to understand it and that is literally how i operated my whole life uh, so i could see that there is this gap and i was like how do i show it to these people but eventually i could i was good enough to and, and at that point sketch had come out as yeah. a tool and sketch is so intuitive versus photoshop i could just quickly mock things up i could show them my ad ideas and they gave me an option that they could they could uh, you know they didn't want to lose a developer resource hiring an ios developer is also a tough thing uh, so they didn't, they didn't want to lose an ios developer they said hey you know what two days a week you work as a designer three days you can work as an ios developer i was like okay whatever in the meantime i run into a friend who eventually becomes one of my co-founders at listen vipass so it was me vipass of navin bhargav who started listen i ran into vipass at a party and vipass is like dude we just need someone who's uh, has a development background because we are setting up a team where we want to we want someone who can prototype but they they were trying to make quick prototypes of things and i'm someone who's already already design minded and you can make prototypes of these things uh so that's how i got into housing and that was my entry into the design team at housing but i was like the most non designery designer there yeah. but just by having everyone around me just by learning from everyone around me housing is where i got the stamp of an interaction designer on my employment contract and that's how the journey started nice that's great man because the thing is that in your previous conversations that i've seen you have online you mentioned that you started coding because that was your way of interacting with machines right what you you mentioned earlier that what you really like was how you were speaking to machines and they were responding back how has um ui ux design or design in general done that for you in a way as well or does it fulfill the same purpose or has it or has that turned out to be an alternative i think uh, i think it's pretty much in line with what i said it's like you know where where by talking to a machine it doesn't mean that we are verbally speaking to it yeah by button the machine does something for you and it speaks an app speaks to you through copy uh and an app can be or like another person can speak to you through an app you're facilitating a conversation with another person so i think that is the the whole interaction aspect of apps is what uh, intrigued me and is something that still uh i something that i still find interesting in our field awesome man that's awesome so let's talk more about housing right in housing you uh, like you mentioned like you were one of the most non designed designers and because you still had that core fundamentals of a developer right and you were working there as a part of this initiative called housing labs yes so can you tell us more about that 
So uh, housing labs, uh, so labs is a concept that you, if you may not have heard of in other companies, so some companies try a concept called labs where they do a bunch of experimental products. Now, uh, there were four of us who were part of housing labs and we were, uh, the, the cool thing that we were doing was that we were just a mini startup within housing. And we were trying to build a few different products. And one of the products that I was helping build was a product called People. Uh, we just uh, came up with the name. It was just like, imagine a product adjacent to housing. If you're building a real estate website, what if you can build a network for people to manage their societies or something like that? Uh, it was just a concept. It was scrapped, but it was an interesting experience. Like, for example, another labs concept we were doing was, what if housing can create a product for uh, premium houses and what if you can have video tours so right. you walk and do all of that so we built these prototypes and there are certain limitations to uh, certain tools that we might, might use for example uh, principle or whatever that we use sometimes there's a wall that we hit and this one interaction that we were building uh, it was like creating a tour of a house and uh, moving and navigating the video and showing like a little map of where the dot is moving and all of that. And I, I built it in iOS, but I was also uh, helping uh, doing, so, so I mean, the thing that I was actually doing is interaction design right. in a way. It was not just a pure UI UX. Uh, it's interaction design is also a sub part of UI UX today, I would say. Uh, so it was a very interesting thing, but see, that's what happened. That's how I started at housing. Slowly, slowly housing actually, I mean, uh, they decided to shut down labs. Yeah. Usually labs are one of the first teams to get shut down if there are budget problems. <laughs> uh, so labs got shut down and I just was given the position of any other designer. And I just had to do it now. I was like, Hey man, now this is it. This is it. You have to do it now. And I just worked a regular project that any other designer is given They're like hey there's this, this buying guide that uh, we're going to show new develop new uh, buyers and uh, if people don't know anything about real estate they should be able to know about this and it was like a 30 page document uh, and i was like man who's going to read this so yeah so that's when like i had to like really work on this thing but that's the thing where if you're in a big company and you have like smart people around you, there are these foundations. So, for example, if we had a solid design system, or uh, I, I I knew how to make things work. Uh, after a point, you it, it becomes when you have a design system, it's a lot about UX. You don't have to think too much about UI because that thinking has been done. Yeah. Uh, so I slowly went in that direction uh, and understood how uh how, how design works so that was housing nice this is so exciting man because um i'm totally aligned with how um, i can understand how you might have been so excited doing interaction design because once you're tapping things and seeing that oh something responded to something else immediately based on what you inserted it's just a different uh, rush and sometimes you feel like hey if i could just instead of designing screens separately and then moving to interaction, if I could just do everything on principle itself, right? And yeah. that's great. And from here, you moved to your role uh, being a co-founder at Listen, right? So can you tell us more uh, about Listen in terms of what was your mindset change when you moved from a designer to a co-founder role when it was the four of you guys working as co-founders? Because there is definitely a different kind of atmosphere uh, when you're a part of the team and when you're working as a designer in a company versus when you're co-founding a company, right? And one uh, is that. And second is what were the what were some of the challenges that you faced being a co-founder? Okay. Uh, so I'll first uh, talk about how things were different. Uh, and I think it's um, how things were different. We'll also talk about the challenges. <laughs> Uh, so the, the thing is, if you're doing something of your own, you are not being told what to do at all, right? So everything is something that you have to do on your own. The 
the challenging bit is that there is no clarity you don't know what is happening so you have to really believe in yourself and also take decisions and work on things that you're uncomfortable with if you are a person who is not a product person and not a business person you have to be one because this is your own product exactly so you yourself these things so my one of my biggest learnings and my fun most fun learnings from being a co-founder was actually uh manipulating data myself so um uh, if uh i mean uh, i i mean it's something that designers do as well uh, i mean you probably look at data uh, uh but whatever you use but the the difference here was that i was also creating the events that were being tracked so usually as a designer or someone else in a company you just consume the data but i was also designing the structure for the data hey you know what i think we should track this button we should track this we should track that and then writing queries on top of that usually if you're working in a company you have like a data scientist or someone doing that but the cool thing is a product like amplitude just makes it super easy you don't you don't need to be a developer or data scientist to do that you just like write a few filters and you just need to know what to think so that's what i learned i i learned how to think like a product guy uh and that is how i again deviated from design slightly but learned an adjacent role all of these roles are very adjacent to each other yeah. uh so that was one of one of my biggest learnings from that but also secondly uh i uh had a lot of fun learning uh a lot of cool design successes and failures from my other co-founders as well like so abhinav was uh, the uh, one of the main designers uh, so i was helping out more on the ios side uh, because of my already all, because i already had experience in that uh, and then uh, I, i i could see you know abhinav really uh, making one ui and we would build it we would test it and then the thing is that is just one or two people who are developing everything right it's it takes much longer versus in a company like it was just like so much effort you're trying to be so careful about it and then that was one thing and then the other thing was going outside my comfort zone now another thing where i went outside my comfort zone was i had barely ever done any sort of branding design and i was the one who came up with the icon for the app and the, the branding for listen Uh, we had a few different concepts that we had come up with but uh we tried a bunch of different things we wanted to try like a lightning bolt but it's just so predictable you see it on facebook messenger uh you know we didn't think about it we did these mock lightning bolt and the next day we were like man facebook messenger has a lightning bolt on it so uh and then it was just like okay two people listening together what what uh what does it feel like and we just made these two headphones looking in opposite directions and it was just the most basic metaphor that was just so straightforward it really conveys what we do and this is something that was very important to to uh to us as a startup where we were trying to design a brand that if i just design an abstract brand people don't know what my app does you know because i'm just not a popular brand so if it's a popular brand they can do whatever they want people still know what they do if there if there's a g people know it's google uh but we're not that we had to design something that people who don't know recognize so right. i designed something that conveyed that awesome so branding design and being a product guy were your biggest challenges or the mindset changes that happened while you were working at listen right and have you used these learnings or uh, in your uh, future journey as a designer and how have you done it uh a lot man a lot so uh the the when so so after that uh, i'll just tell you a bit about my journey after that so uh after listen we decided to shut down listen it was working out and i was working as uh a ui ux principal at lazy8 uh um, which is a design agency based out of delhi mm. i did a lot of work with them uh but then i just wanted to work on a product and i wanted to work in a different country i just wanted to work in a different place i i was like okay you know what i'm i've been living in delhi for like 27 years let me just try try a different place uh 
I got this job at Omeo and now Omeo is interesting like a company that has uh you know let's say I don't know like a, a million of but I know more than a million, maybe 20, 30 million visits a month. You know, if it, if you're working on a product like that, that is where my knowledge helped me so much. I was like, so I had already worked on this amplitude stuff. I was like, I was, I was really surprising some of my peers, uh, be it from any field that I already knew how to, run data and all these things. So like there were some initiatives that a product manager would look at or like they would say, hey, you know what, maybe we can work on this feature, maybe we can do that. I would already have that idea. I would already tell them that, hey, you know what, if people click here, the conversion's better, people are not able to convert at this step because I already knew the numbers. So <laughs> this was and this was something that was a big bottleneck. So because people just did not know how to use these tools, I had designers who would just wait for days to send an email to a product manager or another uh, analyst in the company to try to get this data, but they would have to wait, right? If it's obviously it's a very complex query, then it obviously can't do that. But it's something very basic that how many, like for example, what's the most common resolution of devices on our platform? Because we were trying to make a design decision that, you know what, what size should our artboards be in Figma? And you would design for the popular uh, user base. You would say, okay, you know what, these users can work the best or whatever, something something like that. Whatever you decision you want to make, but you want to know what those numbers are. Yeah. And I whipped out those numbers in two minutes. So this kind of stuff really helped me. And if I had not done that and listened, I would not be doing this right now. That's amazing. Also. Um, from a lot of previous folks that uh, folks that I've talk, spoken to previously, whenever I ask them how they've moved from India to abroad when it comes to designing, a lot of them uh, say that they've gotten the opportunity through referrals, right? Uh, but very few of them say that they actually applied through the interview, went through the interview process, and went through all of that. So, what was how, what was your process? How did you start with your journey at Omeo? Uh, so it's it's being it's about being very strategic. Right. So uh, you sort of it's you don't blindly apply to any company. I think there are certain companies where referrals might work better because there are certain companies where there's there's so many resumes that enter their inbox every day. If your uh, resume sort of climbs up, then it's good, right? A referral helps you with that. Uh, but for me, I was being very strategic that A, I was targeting countries that were more immigration friendly. So the US was not in my list at all. Uh, I Everybody knows that there are immigration issues with the US. You have to wait ages for a visa. And even if you do get a visa, you, you might just lose that visa in three years because that's, I think, the limit for the visa. You have to renew it. Yeah. Uh, so I was not, I had to, I would have loved to work in the US. There's some pretty great uh, companies out of there. Uh, and a lot of great people that I know who work there, but that was out of the question. So now I was left with Europe and basically Europe because I was looking at what are the other big startup hubs and it was basically Berlin and Amsterdam uh, in Europe that are one of the big startup hubs. Now I started looking at both of these startup hubs and looking at which companies have raised funding recently and are expanding. So that means these companies are actively hiring and they really need people. So, and if you're a company that is uh, uh, is, ex- is uh, expanding really quickly, um, that means uh, the, the expanding really quickly and has funding, that means uh, you can sponsor a visa more likely. Uh, so all of these factors sort of came together and I started applying very strategically because the thing is, if you apply blindly as well, you would just get a lot of rejections and they are also very disheartening. <laughs> you know, when you just keep getting rejections over and over again, it's just frustrating. So just be more strategic from the get-go. Now, number two, what I did was um, I I tried to make sure that my portfolio, it's it's very old. If you, if you see the link that I have, it's something that I made three years ago. 
Uh, I haven't updated it much, but it's it, it has a lot of flaws. But it what it does well is this: it gives you a very quick glance into the breadth of my work. Now, not a glance into my work, right? That's what I'm uh, emphasizing here. So that I felt was very important because the viewer, the end user of this website is a recruiter, not an actual designer. Yeah. Now, how do I make it easily understandable for a recruiter? If obviously, if you're a designer, if it looks half decent, they will judge you on that as well. But they just they don't necessarily want to know about your life history because they will see that on your resume or other places as well, or even on your LinkedIn. So the first thing you see is my work. You just see me. You see my face. You see me saying hello, and you see my work. So that's just my hypothesis. I'm not sure if this is something that works for everyone. But I think it. I think I thought it made a lot of sense because I I thought who is the end user of my website? End user of my website is a recruiter. They're going to look at it for a maximum of one minute, and most of them would just look at it for thirty seconds. So how can I make it glanceable for that? If I write a case study that's two pages long, that's great. The person who's going to like it is the person who's eventually going to hire you once you get an interview. But to get that interview. I had to work on this. So my process for interviewing is the website gets me through the door, but then once I actually have an interview, I do not show my website as my portfolio. I actually have a keynote presentation where I sort of use that for case studies, and uh, because there's fewer words there, whenever you're presenting something, it's better to talk and have fewer words and to show what you are trying to show there. Uh, And this keynote is sort of sort of changes according to the position I'm applying to. So if it's the kind of company that would appreciate a certain kind of project I did in the past, I put that in the keynote versus something else. So I think all of these together have helped me uh, in the interviewing process because I've uh, this has been my process when I got to Omeo and now recently when I got my new job at Center. That's really nice of you uh, to share your strategy like this because, man, I myself have not heard this strategy before. And this is listening to this and thinking about it is like, man, you really put some thought before just me like, okay, I'm done with India. I'm just going to go abroad. But how will I do that? This is something which is that goes in the back end, but people don't really think about it. And about your keynote, do you update it? Uh, uh, do you keep updating it, or do you have it one prepared, and do you just tweak it around? Uh, yeah, actually, I uh, I made one. Uh, uh, I made one uh, two years ago. I did not use uh, the same keynote for uh, Omeo, but right after Omeo, I made another one, and I've been using that format. But I just add new case studies to that same sort of. Structure, visual structure. I'm kind of happy with it. Uh, it's very minimal, so I don't need a lot of aesthetic to it. What I do is that uh, actually I just whenever the slides for a particular project come or a startup, whatever that I previously worked with, I just use that branding, sort of that aesthetic to make it just look consistent with that. But that's pretty much it. Got it. That's great. So Abhiraj, this was your journey so far at. Omeo, right? Now at yeah. Omeo, you took the role. Uh, you took the role of a senior designer, right? So one question I wanted to ask was: Were you a part of hiring new designers? Yes. Right. So now, why I'm, I'm going. To, so this is why I'll be asking the next question: Is that since you were a part of hiring designers as well, versus all your experiences before <laughs> and when you started working as a designer, as a developer, you've learned your skills as a product guy as well. You've been a co-founder. You have all this breadth, right, of information, which is why I'm assuming you would know exactly what to look for in a designer, right? So, how so? How would you hire someone in India versus how would you hire someone in Berlin? What are the, are there any differences? Honestly, no. Yeah. Okay. Realistically, no. Now, uh, what? People sometimes really, I've seen people in hiring miss out on 
right. with when hi, when they're hiring designers is communication skills. Um, because man, when you're working as a designer, the most important skill to have would be communication. Yeah. Um, and uh, how no, communication and even I would say articulation. Uh, you know, like how you express those ideas, how you put them in place, how you package those ideas and how you are, uh, the most basic thing with design is that you don't have to take, how you take feedback, how you work with those sort of things. Uh, so those are the things I, I, I look at a lot. I look at very carefully. Uh, but then, after, so one, that is the foundation. But after that, things change because every team, the dynamics are different. So, for example, let's say uh, we, as a team, feel that we are relatively weaker at visual design. So, at that point, we'll, we'll look at what we're looking for in that position because not everyone has everything as a strong suit. Not everyone is the best visual designer. Not everyone is the best interaction designer. Not everyone is the best uh, UX designer, you know. But all of these roles have to be packaged together. And you can't expect a single product designer to be amazing at everyone. There is like a little bit of uh, everything. A product designer is somewhat of a generalist at all of these. And we sort of use everybody's strengths around us. So uh, w- what I would look at at hiring is sometimes these, these things are very specific. So for example, if someone is a great visual designer and if they've gotten rejected, uh, maybe it's because uh, they were great at visual design, uh, but some of their UX fundamentals were not as strong. And it, I've seen this happen sometimes when people are strong visual designers, they emphasize on that a lot as their skills, are, which is great, right? Like design is also a visual, a visual medium, right? Uh, but as when you're looking for a job as a product designer, you need to have both skills. Um, so... But let's say our team, as a team, we are la- la- uh, we feel we need an even better visual designer to help with us. We would compromise on that skill because right. we're like the rest of us are probably stronger at the other things. We can probably help this person and develop this person as well. So sometimes hiring is just so specific to the company where they are, what they're looking for. Sometimes these requirements are very specific. So. I would also give people feedback that sometimes if you get like a rejection from somewhere, it's not you, it's them, you know, it's just like, you are probably good at what you do, but they just weren't looking for something that, uh, you have, you know? Yeah. True. This is something which a lot of folks, I feel a lot of folks do not realize this or don't think of it that way. They always feel like there's something wrong with me because it was never conveyed to them that, hey, we are looking someone with a skill set more towards this role. We want someone who's better at interactions and you were much better at visual design, but not that good at interactions, which is why we had to let you go. This kind of communication is lacking in a lot of places. I agree with that. So another question which I wanted to ask Abhiraj is, so what according to you is the difference uh, in terms of skills or responsibility the ambiguity of solving problems what is it uh, what is the difference between a junior designer one who's just started working in a company versus a senior designer interesting i think it's it's a little bit of everything you know the thing is that uh, product design is a craft that has a lot of areas right so there is problem. I would say that there is a threshold where if you are decently good at UX, product design, research, uh, all of these, that's when uh, I, we would classify you as a senior designer. So a junior designer might be really good at one thing, but then what about research? Maybe they lack the research skills. Maybe they lack the visual design skills. So there is a certain benchmark that we draw, but this is... Uh, this varies from company to company. So we at Omeo drew a certain benchmark that you have to be at a certain level. And from a senior designer, we also expected uh, leadership and some sort of mentorship uh, ability. So we created like a 60-40 IC versus leadership sort of 
uh, structure for senior designers at Omeo. It might be different at other companies, might be different for you. Uh, but over here, it was 60-40. So my role was, I was actually uh, mentoring junior and mid-level designers uh, with their projects. And uh, a lot of times, uh, there are things that, you know, it's also experience. Sometimes, like, there are things that just uh, came obviously to me. Or sometimes... Uh, one thing, one thing with a with a junior designer or like any designer is when you understand when you really explore the whole solution space. Now, the thing I see with a lot of junior designers is that when they're looking at a particular solution space, they end up narrowing themselves down too early. Very right. early, they narrow themselves down towards one direction, and that is something that is very important, and it comes with time. Uh, so you really need to explore the breadth of the solution space. Uh, and this is something I saw while I was mentoring junior designers that they went really far down this one path. But I was like, guys, uh, like maybe we need to really take two or even three steps back and maybe start from here because maybe we forgot to explore this one path which was so far back. Hmm. I think this is one thing I've seen. True. Also, um, so... Like you mentioned, right? Junior designers often have a tendency of having this tunnel vision and going and deep diving into one thing, right? But as a as a mentor or as a senior, you do realize that where this is leading to, and hence you prefer that hey, come a few steps back, let's move on to a different direction. And um, how do you feel junior designers can be mindful of this and be that okay? I've done this now. I need to move on to another thing and cover up my breath. I would say, I would say question yourself when you feel just for one second, when you, when you feel like you've designed something, question yourself that, Hey, is there another way to do this? And just ask yourself, ask yourself that question. That's it. Like literally, we just don't ask ourselves that question enough. Right. You know, there's so many solutions to one problem. And we just usually pick that one or those one or two solutions, but we just never explore that many right also like you so you seem to be a person who's very mindful of the things not just that are happening that you're doing but that are happening around you uh, at least i feel so based on the conversation that we're having right now right and like you mentioned that you've been mentoring uh, folks uh, not just as a part of the i am at 10k designer but also in the company itself you were doing so at omeo i believe so yeah. uh what do you feel um, are the responsibilities of a senior designer when it comes to mentoring junior designers? And like, because we had a similar conversation earlier this evening as well, right? In terms of design leaders, of how con- mindful should they be of when they're taking up junior designers to also consider their career growth? Exactly. Right? So... I'll tell you what, what was the most interesting thing uh, as a mentor that I faced. So all of us have the tendency, I think this must have happened with you also, that you you quickly want to, you know the answer and you quickly want to just fix it. You see that artboard or that Figma file in front of you, you just fix it. But that's the problem. If you're mentoring someone, you are not the one who's going to change their Figma file. Because that way they're not going to learn. And that is an art that you learn as a senior designer or a design leader even further up the path is how to tell someone that how, how, to, how to tell someone how to reach the solution rather than telling them the solution itself. Right. So I was making that mistake a couple of times when I was mentoring someone and I was I told them the solution. And that was my fault because that way the person didn't learn anything. They just got their answers on a platter, right? So I had to be very mindful of that. And as soon as I made I made that mistake, soon after I was very careful and I was really... So this brings us back to communication, right? Like if communication is not a foundation at, at a senior designer level or even further up, like that's, that's going to be your bread and butter, you know? So, uh, the way you tell, you talk to someone about a solution is just super crucial. And 
the best thing is best thing about that mentoring is that when you see someone reach the solution on their on their own that is amazing to see so i i just found that very fulfilling that's great man this is regarding design right in terms of hands on work that goes on what about uh, times when you want to know what the about the person whom you're mentoring where do they see themselves or how you can push them or give them that nudge or boost so that they can get to their future career growth yeah uh, i think i think you should just have a very open and transparent conversation if you're mentoring someone just ask them straight up right where where do you see yourself where do you want to go if they are not sure maybe you can help them exactly. because worked with them a little bit maybe you've observed them you've looked at their skill sets you look at what they're good at what they're not good at and you can maybe help them uh refine both if they're already good at something they can get even better if they're not good at something help them with the resources to get better at that so empowering people empowering the ones around you is what a mentor's job is true so because i read this recently somewhere and i was like man i don't remember when's the last time i've been asked where i see myself or where i want to go and i was like if i ask this someone i'm pretty sure i could make their day and yeah yeah exactly so abhiraj moving on um what has been your experience being an industry mentor like can you give tell us a bit about that uh it's been great um it's been like uh so i'll be a bit more specific i wanted i'm asking along the lines of what were your expectations and what yeah. has turned out to be and what is your feedback uh, based on like your experience so it has definitely met my expectations and uh i i would say that what is different for me this time around is in my in my career i have basically men- mentored people or uh help people out who are already designers in some way so they they sort of like figured their own way out in this whole field versus now i'm talking to people who are completely new uh but and and the thing that i love is the level of enthusiasm i'm seeing among these people uh which is which is insane and it's i'm kind of jealous of the people i'm mentoring because uh <laughs> it's it's like it's like i feel like they're lucky that they that there are there are people to you know really um uh, help them out uh and it's just it's just so nice to see something that's structured so well uh the the way the assignments are the way everything else is the um uh, the way uh everyone is what i'm amazed at is also the way everyone is taking feedback i was actually not expecting people to take feedback so well it's just a human tendency it's something that we learn over time we're very uh protective of our work and our things and if people leave comments and they criticize our work or something and people have taken the feedback very well so it's been it's been great i have i have uh, learned so much and we're just halfway through the yeah. course right there's a lot more to see exactly and what was what is some advice if you had to give to the cohort members um because they for them for us is just it's providing uh giving feedback right or giving advice but for them they like okay we are getting this advice from someone who's been a designer or developer a co-founder someone who's working abroad and so many things right so what advice would you give um to a cohort member such that it lasts like that's just going to re- rewire the neurons in a way <laughs> man there's no there's no like magic potion but it's it's about uh i would say just asking questions man asking the right questions always ask questions why why is it this way like if you if you open your phone and you see that is asking you to swipe up instead of swipe left just question yourself for a second and if you're a, if you're a person in the cohort now you're empowered enough uh as a designer you know some of the ins and outs and if you see the uh especially if you see the additional reading that uh 
Ratnav and other people have recommended. There's some great material there. So just ask yourself questions. Just that's it. Uh, if you ask questions, you may get answers, or may you may not get answers, but at least you're thinking about something. Yeah. So that's all I would say. That's great advice, man. And what are so? So if I had to ask you, since we've discussed your entire journey in this short span of time that we've been conversing, right? What are the top three learnings from your design journey so far? Okay, so um, my top three learnings. There is a purpose behind everything. Uh, whenever you're designing something, whenever you're doing anything, uh, as a as a very uh, as a designer in my in the early stages, I was like this this person who just look at pretty things or like you know look at design as something that's very superfluous or like a coat of paint. But the whole form and function thing is just so interesting. I think that's my biggest learning that like that that a thing that's pretty doesn't necessarily translate into something that's uh, useful and something that's useful uh, isn't always pretty but when these two come together when form follows the function so the function should always be the core so if you do it the other way around that's where things really uh, get problematic but when you have the function as the foundation and the form follows it man that's just beautiful like uh, one of my one of my most favorite things uh, that's come out recently um, is the iPhone 10 interaction. So this came out like what two years ago? The iPhone 10 came out three years ago. Yeah. But just everyone's mindset just changed that there's just no button anymore, and you just swipe up from the bottom. But you swipe up and you go halfway. I just I just love gesture based navigation because it's just like a more natural way of interacting with devices because that's how our fingers move that's how our things move we don't we, we don't interact like this with anything else in the real world where we just like go and do this we do that we do not do that in the real world we do yeah. compound the gestures are uh, that natural form it just makes me feel so much more connected to this device in my hand anyway I digress so my one learning was the form and function one. The other learning has been, um, I've gotten a lot better over the years at understanding users. So in the end, we're building products for human beings. And when you would work in a bigger company, your human beings sometimes get replaced with just a statistic, right? But the, pro the problem is that statistics are for other people in the company. They're also for designers. But for designers, we are also, we have to work with empathy. We actually work with humans. And uh, that's something that has been another big learning. So, you know, I talked about all these analytics and all the data. I did everything that I did, right? But in the end, who, who is behind all of these numbers? It's a human being. And uh, understanding humans is, has been another big learning for me. Like, for example, at Omeo, understanding human emotions. So, for example, when I was at Omeo, so whenever you've done a travel booking, so let's say you're booking a, a flight ticket worth 500 euros. Yeah. Okay. That's a lot of money. And uh, the human emotion that comes with that is anxiety. So now when I'm designing something, I would have never thought about these emotions. How is a person feeling when they're interacting with the screen? And I found out, you know what? My users are feeling anxious. They're not happy, sad, whatever. They're anxious yeah. because they're about to spend so much money on this. And the way these flights work and how these things work, they're non-refundable, blah, blah, blah. That's how the industry works. So that is what I took in. And that is what I took into my design. How do I reduce anxiety? Not about how do I convert more? How do I do something else? Like, how do I reduce anxiety on this? How do I, how do I make instill confidence in people, you know? So that's my second learning. And 
Uh, the last one uh, would be prototyping is so so underrated in the industry. Yeah. Man, I'm so angry. I'm so damn angry. And my problem with prototyping is that people also think of prototyping as just micro interactions, which is cool as well. But man, just make prototypes, man. Like, come on. Uh, <laughs> it's one of my favorite things that is just so underrated. It's like you're building a product that people interact with. If you yourself don't interact with it, don't test the damn interaction, what's the point? So yeah, that's my top three. Damn, this is some great. I love your last point that you said. Inter- uh, prototypes are so underrated because, man, I didn't know how to use principle like nine, eight, around six, seven to eight months ago, and now I cannot, I can't uh, imagine myself get, trying to get feedback without sending or recording of my principle file, right? So <laughs> this was great, Abhiraj. This brings us to the end of our interview. Thanks a lot for taking the time, especially since I know you've already. Uh, spent your time today and yeah. it was great man what a great conversation i loved uh engaging with you especially since i love talking to developers turned designers as well me being a front-end web developer as well and nice. yeah, it was a great session thanks for listening to this episode and i hope you liked it if you watched the entire video drop a comment below sharing your favorite learning from this interview to let us know subscribe to the whiteboard.fm youtube channel to check out other episodes and clips from this interview This podcast is a part of the 10K Designers Network. You can check out other projects on 10kdesigners.com.